All right, well, today we're going to take a look at the birth of Christ. And again, no birth in history has made such an impact. There's been no person else, no other person that has ever lived that is still the focus, that their birth is still the focus of so much attention 2,000 years earlier. No, no other birthday even comes close. It's hard, it's, uh, it's hard to even think of a who would come in second place. The gap is that difference. The birth of Christ is a big deal in the world today. Even non-believers, the idea of Christmas is celebrated in so many cultures around the world. And there's no other birthday that's... And again, what do I keep saying? If you don't want to believe this is of God, this is, again, another one of those boom, 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 long lines of coincidences and secular miracles, I call them. Incredibly huge dramatic things that are very hard to explain without this being real. The birth of Jesus Christ changed the world, and it's still the focus of so much attention 2,000 years later. We're going to study about the birth of Christ today. Uh, a miracle baby born to a young girl. And the world's never been the same. I saw somebody uh, who did not believe in the virgin birth. They were actually very hostile to it. Uh, said, one little girl's lie changed the world forever. Yeah, I want you to focus on that change the world forever. And how did one little girl out of all those hundreds of millions of girls who have had babies out of wedlock, how come what made this one so special? What, what was it, really? And is there any reason to, to think that maybe there was something a lot more going on here than just a little girl's lie. This miracle baby born to a little girl. Remember, we've been studying about Elizabeth, too, her relative. This, this gal who, in her old age, and should not have been able to have a child. Uh, also, this miracle child who would be the forerunner, who would prepare the way for the Messiah. And again, the world has never been the same. So as we read today, and you can turn now to, to Luke chapter 2. As, as we read today, you can think how Christ's birth has really dramatically altered the flow of human history, the way things were before, the way things were asked after, but also, and I, I want you to think about this more importantly, ask yourself realistically, has the fact, now think about this, there's a world full of darkness, death, fear, you live your life, you suck air until you can't anymore, you keel over, you become worm food. If there is no God, trust me, nobody cares. They might care, your friends, family, they, you know, next, next generation, maybe you echo a little bit on them, next generation a little bit, you know. Think, think how many generations back in your own family tree do you have to go where it really doesn't make that big an impact on your life. Think about all these choices we think are so important. I'm going to live a moral life. I'm going to deny myself. I'm not going to do that. Somebody who lived 200 years ago, do you really care about their moral life, the choices they made? None of this matters if there is no God who loves us enough to come down into this mess, this cesspool, this incredible wickedness. And we're all, we're all playing for number one and trying to use other people to gain advantage. And, and God, holy God who knew no sin, came down in the muck in the mire so he could grab us out of the out of that he said i love you and i want to make you part of my family we're going to go to a place where life makes sense where things where things are right where justice rules where mercy rules where love is supreme the way things are supposed to be brothers and sisters the birth of christ the way your life is going the way you're thinking your attitudes your priorities does the fact that God came into this dark world and was born in order to die for your sin, please listen, does that make any difference to you? So I, say, I first ask, think about how it changed the world. I want to ask, how has the birth of Christ changed you? How has it changed me? Is my life different because there's a God that cared enough to come after me, to chase me down? When I was trying to ignore them, when I was praying hard to get, when I had all these other priorities of things that don't last, the things that don't really matter, that I thought were such a big deal. Does the birth of Christ matter to you, and has it changed your life? All right, we're in uh, Luke chapter 2, and uh, you know what? 
Okay, let's just read the first three verses there. In those days, so Luke, this historian, is trying to give some detail. And we went over this when we started Matthew and when we were going through our, our study in the entire Bible in one year. Uh, there is some difficulty with the dating here. And either Quirinius was, uh, he was a Roman, he was a Roman military leader in Syria. So maybe that's what Luke meant instead of giving him the title of governor. He was a governor later, whether he was a lieutenant governor at this time, and since he was just called the governor, just like we call past presidents, we still call them president whatever, whatsoever. I don't know exactly how that went down, but uh, there's a little trouble with the, with the dating there. This is the general time period. In those days, Caesar Augustus, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Uh, this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to, to register. And I think they, uh, there's some debate whether Mary was also the town of David or whether the uh, same family line as Joseph or whether people went with their husbands so you didn't have to separate husbands and wives, which would seem reasonable. Uh, it starts off with saying, in those days, Caesar Augustus. Th don't the Romans always have the coolest names? Uh, Tiberius, Caesar Augustus, Tyrannus. Uh, Caesar Augustus, uh, if you do little, a little background on his name, his full name was Imperator, which is what soldiers would call their military leader. Caesar, which is the same word where we get the Russian Tsar from, right? Caesar. Uh, Phileas Augustus, uh, Caesar Div, Div Phileas Augustus, and Div Phileas means son of the divine. So he was called, in his title, he called himself the son of the divine because he was the adopted son of Julius Caesar, who was uh, declared divine by the Roman Senate. Uh, Augustus meant the, re the revered or the great. And so he's imperator, I'm military leader, Caesar, I'm the emperor, son of God, the revered. There's not even a name there anymore. His original name, uh, which totally skipped my brain just right now, Octavian, thank you, Octavius, uh, his, uh, he, he just let that one go because he just wanted to keep tacking on these little titles that uh, sounded so wonderful. And, of course, he, he had the Roman Senate do that for him. So look at this. Luke tells the birth of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? Son of God. And he starts it off by telling us about another fellow who claimed the same title. In the same day as that guy who's dead by the time I'm writing, by the way, <laughs> by the time Luke is writing, this son of God, so-called, is already dead. And Luke begins his story of Jesus Christ, the son of God, by telling us about uh, uh, Caesar Augustus, who had to claim the same title. Augustus also had a great impact on world history. Uh, he conquered vast territories for Rome. Remember that story of uh, Mark Antony? And his wife, Cleopatra, she was the last pharaoh of, of Egypt. Egypt was a client state, but, but uh, autonomous at that time, independent from, from Rome. And Cleopatra and Mark Antony wanted to raise troops to go fight the Parthians. And, and uh, Caesar Augustus didn't want to do that. And so they got into a row and they were fighting. And, and so he defeated uh, Mark Antony and, and Cleopatra. This is the same fella. He made peace with the Parthian Empire, and he got back some Roman war standards, their, their eagle banners, and that was a, a big deal. Uh, the month of August, I believe in his lifetime, was named after him, Caesar Augustus. How would you like to have a month named after you? Uh, he reformed the Roman tax code, which is interesting. He's famous for tax, uh, taxation, and that's also right here in the text. And he was worshipped as a deity in his day while he was still alive. And so if you look at Roman artwork, they have these, you know, he's wearing the breast, breastplate and he looks like this great military leader. But if you look at Egyptian artwork, he's got a pharaoh's hat and he's got the beard and he's going like this or something, you know, because the way they put it on their walls. Uh, the Greek word, well, well, for here first. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire, mine says Roman world, your translation might say entire inhabited world or entire known world or entire civilized world. The Greek word here is oikumene, and at first it meant the inhabited world. It's where, by the way, we get our word ecumenical from. Ecumenical church, the whole church, the whole world of Christian faith coming together. It did not literally mean, when you read this, be careful that you don't, you don't force the Bible to say something it's not actually saying. 
when it says the entire world here, I've had people actually say, well, it said the entire world, and the people in Persia, and the people in India, and the people in China, and the, the people in Mesoamerica, none of them paid taxes, so the Bible is wrong. No, let the Bible use common language the way we all do, that everybody paid taxes. Uh, everybody was at, at uh, Burger King yesterday. Well, is that a lie? No, it means that a lot of people we know were there. And, and the Bible says that the, the whole world went, well, they're talking about the whole Roman world. And, and I don't know why we have to make things like this an issue. Just let language be what it is, and we all talk like that, and it did not mean a literal reading here is not to force it to say something that it wasn't meant to say. Can I get an amen? amen. That, that would be a not literal to, to force it to say the entire globe of the earth, although the Greeks knew the world was a globe at least 600 B.C., and the, and the Romans got that. All Roman philosophers and scholars knew that the world was round. But again, it's not talking about the whole globe here. It's talking about the Roman world. Uh, let's read 2, 4 through 7. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee, so up north there, to Galilee in Judea to Bethlehem in the town of David because he belonged to the house of David. So that, took, that was about a 70-mile journey. 70 miles to get down there, approximately. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, fiancé, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And again, we've talked about how Jesus Christ had uh, brothers and at least two sisters, because the Bible says sisters in the plural. But this is their first child, obviously. Uh, and they, they didn't have any union until after Christ was born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them available. There's no guest room. There's no room in the inn for them. When we talked a little bit a, a while ago about God coming down into the muck and the mire, uh, first off, early Christians said, early Christian tradition, I mean very early, said that he was probably born in a cave that was used as a manger. Okay, So it's a cave where you might house sheep or cattle. And uh, there's the feeding trough where these animals would eat. And that's what Jesus Christ was, he was born in there. He was, you ever been in a barn? They smell like billy goats. <laughs> that's what my little cousin once said. Uh, they, they're, they're stinky. Uh, there's flies. It's nasty. It's not a wonderful place to be born when, but it's very symbolic, isn't it? Perfect God coming down into the muck and the mire, the crap, the, the disgusting filth of this fallen world. All the stuff that happens in real life, all the stuff that happens in our minds, uh, all of this, Christ came right into the middle of this nastiness. Why? Why wasn't he born in some palace? Well, any, anyways, any, any earthly palace is like a pigsty compared to heaven, right? But, but why was he born where all these animals are, all these flies, all this filth and, and dirtiness? And I think it's very symbolic of God, the Holy One, loving us so much. And, and I heard this illustration once long ago, and I've used it before. It's like, you know, when you're going camping and there's those outdoor, and sometimes you look down there and there's garter snakes down there, you know. If you're a little kid, you gotta be careful. I heard about a little kid who fell down in one of those. Uh, Dad went down after him. God loves us so much that when we're covered in filth, the one who knew no sin, who hates sin, would come down in the middle of all of it, all the pain, all the brokenness, reach right down in the muck, jump right down in the muck to get us out of it because he loves us so much. Jesus Christ born in a manger because he loves us so much. Uh, Nazareth to Bethlehem, I, I said, about 70 miles. Imagine you're pregnant, probably third trimester, right? It doesn't say that she had the baby right when she got there. It says while she was there, she had to be. So we don't know how long they were there, but maybe three days if they're hoofing it. Three days with swollen ankles, swollen feet. Three days with an aching back. Maybe they had a donkey. That's the picture we always see. Three days, and who knows? Maybe it was windy. 
Maybe it was dusty. Maybe it rained on them. Maybe there was a, a, a cold snap and it was too cold at night and, and too hot in the day. Three days. Mary, she was a toughie. She was a trooper going all the way there pregnant. And you know, if you travel, by the way, one day by car with air conditioning, oh, I just want to get to my hotel room and I want to take a shower, right? Imagine traveling three days in nature with all the weather, pregnant. Imagine getting up on top of a donkey pregnant. That's not an easy thing. Okay, honey, okay, okay. I wonder how many times they tried that maneuver, you know. And she just wants to find a place to lay down. And there is no room. Just want to clean up. We got a, we got a stable over there. We got a manger out in the cave on the side of that hillside. That's tough. But she was being obedient to God's call on her life. Sometimes being obedient to God means hiking three days while pregnant. For half of you, that will never happen. I'm getting thumbs up from some of the men. Life is not fair. Deal with it. <laughs> I did not just say that. So, that's right. Thank you, my friend. All of us, though, are called not to convenience, not to called to, to easy life. When we come and we're doing the right thing, we're doing the right thing and following Jesus, sometimes we go out of our way. Sometimes life gets very difficult. It's kind of scary maybe. I'm going to have this baby. We can't be on the road. We're on the road. We're going to Bethlehem. Why? Because God's plan all along was to get them down to Bethlehem. The Savior, the Messiah, was going to be born in Bethlehem. The, uh, you, you know uh, Bethel, ba Bethel Baptist Church here in Janesville, uh, Bethel, El, right? House of God. House of God is what it means. Bethlehem means house of bread. Wow, isn't that kind of a cool name? A cool name for, for Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, to be born in the house of bread. Micah chapter 5 says, As for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, because there was more than one Bethlehem in the ancient world, so it's designating which Bethlehem this is. It was the one that was close to Jerusalem. So he goes from the north, travels down close to Jerusalem. As for you, Bethlehem, uh, seemingly insignificant among the clans of Judah. It's a little town. I got in such big trouble in Japan once. I said, uh, Bethlehem was a little town, an unimportant town. It was like Shintomura. Shintomura. Nobody's ever heard of it. It's not important. And a gal from Shintomura in the church really gave it to me after church. I thought, wow, we just talked about such, you, really? But anyways, uh, was, I got to apologize. Uh, from you, from this little town, seemingly insignificant, from you a king will emerge who will rule over Israel on my behalf, one whose origins are from of old. Or maybe it says, are, whose origins are in the distant past. What the heck kind of a sentence is that? In the future, a king will come who will rule, and his origins are from the ancient days. Well, we, we're talking about the Messiah here, aren't we? We're talking about the divine the, the, the God in flesh. Uh, so the Lord will hand the people of Israel over to their enemies. And remember, God, Israel will be wiped out. God will bring them back. Israel will be wiped out. God brings them back. So the Lord will hand the people of Israel over to their enemies until the right time, until the time when the woman in labor gives birth. I think for a few hundred years, that was kind of a bizarre prophecy, wasn't it? It doesn't make sense on one side of it. After the woman in birth <laughs> gives birth, it, it makes a lot more sense. Then the rest of the king's countrymen will return uh, to be reunited with the people of Israel. And I, I almost wonder if that means Gentile believers will be reunited with the people of Israel. He will assume his post and, the shepherd, the, uh, and shepherd the people by the Lord's strength. So this king is going to be called a shepherd. By the sovereign authority of the Lord, his God, they will live securely, for at that time he will be honored. Even in the distant regions of the earth, he will give us peace. And uh, Jesus Christ is the one person that brings peace to people 
from cultures that when this prophecy was given, they had no clue of all these different people groups and tribes and different cultures all over the world. But it said, in the distant regions of the world, people are, are going to honor this king. This king is Jesus Christ. This shepherd is Jesus Christ. This peacemaker, this peace giver is Jesus Christ. Now, in this region, uh, just outside of Jerusalem, around Bethlehem, there was a tower. In this tower, you know, was mentioned back in Genesis as the place where, where Jacob met, went after his beloved Rachel died. The name of the tower, and I don't know how to pronounce it, but it sounds like Migdal Elder. Uh, some people think that this tower is also mentioned in Micah chapter 4, verse 8, as the place that would receive the news of Israel's Messiah. So by this tower, you would receive the news of Israel's Messiah. There's something interesting about that tower. You know why it was there? It guarded the flocks for the city of Jerusalem. It guarded the flocks for the city of Jerusalem. The, the, the Jewish Talmud, the Mishnah, tells us that, that uh, it guarded the flocks that were used for the Jewish temple. So let's read now in uh, Luke chapter 2, 8 through 12. 8 through 12. Why? Why did Jesus come born in a manger? Now why is he born? Why is he proclaimed to a bunch of, to a bunch of shepherds? Shouldn't he have been proclaimed to a bunch of philosophers in China or some wise men in India or, or Greece? Or maybe in, should have been born, I don't know, in Jerusalem, maybe in the temple or in the palace or something where everybody could see it. Or, or better yet, if, he was, <clears throat> if an angel appeared and proclaimed his birth today, we could all whip out smartphones and record it and get a lot of hits on YouTube. Uh, why did Jesus choose this time and this place? Uh, let's think about that as we read. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Aren't these beautiful words? Every Christmas, right? An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified because that's what angels do. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, because that's also what angels do. And, I mean, come on, give me a break. The glory of the road, Lord shone round about them. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be terrified. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. The birth of Christ is not just for the Jewish people, is it? It wasn't just for those shepherds, was it? This is good news of great joy. And what is this good news? That God has not written humanity off. That God hasn't turned our backs on us, turned his back on us because we turn our back on him all the time by our willfulness and our saying, no, I will decide what's right and wrong for me, not you, God, which, right? That was the curse in the garden, right? Humanity was going to decide what's right and wrong for themselves, not God. And, and though we run away from God as fast as we can, God has come. He is pursuing us because of love. This is good news of great joy. The joy is all that burden, all the guilt, all the anger inside. I can let it go, and I can be accepted by God. I can be forgiven. I can get into the relationship with God that we originally meant to have before the whole Adam and Eve thing choking on that fruit and screwing it up all for all of us. I will bring you good news of great joy that's going to be for everybody, for all people. Today, in the town of David, Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. And if you think you don't need a Savior, it's probably because you don't know yourself very well. I need somebody to save me. Oh, wretched man that I am. I'm not going to be able to save myself. I can't fix myself. I need God. I need a Savior. Today, this good news, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. That, they must have thought, that's a weird sign. The angel appears before me. Going to be a sign. This will be a sign for you. What? More fireworks? What? You're going to have an earthquake? What? What are you going to have? You're going to find a baby lying in a feed trough. Oh. Suddenly... A great company of the heavenly hosts appeared all around the angel. A great army 
of heaven appeared around the angel and they were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. And what about this glorious God? He's extending peace to you and I because he loves us. That's the only reason that makes sense. Why? Because he loves us. He loves you. Are you going to stop fighting with him? Are you going to stop fighting with him? Shepherds are not important people. Well, they're important to the sheep, especially if there's wolves around. Uh, shepherds are not important in the, in the way the ancient world looked at. You remember the Egyptians? They looked down at shepherds. They looked down at the Hebrews because they were a, a shepherd nomadic peoples. Uh, the ancient world did not have uh, much respect for shepherds. Uh, slaves, little kids, uh, boys would be shepherds. They're not like some rich person, some merchant. They're not like a, a king or a, or a prince or a general. They're not even like philosophers or, or rabbis or revered teachers. And again, they don't have cell phones. Well, maybe today they probably do, but back then they did not have cell phones and they couldn't record what was going on. Why did God choose uh, this group of shepherds out there? But I want you to think about this. They were social outcasts. They lived much of their lives without a lot of talking. They lived much of their lives apart from humanity. Most Jews, again, considered them actually ceremonially unclean, although these, Jews were, although these shepherds were special. Remember I said that they took care of, probably took care of the flocks that were used in the temple sacrifices. So these, these uh, shepherds were probably special. The Messiah, by the way, was also prophesied to be an outcast. So he was born in the muck and mire because he came to rescue us from the muck and mire. He, he was proclaimed first to who? To social outcasts. And he would himself be an outcast. In this great passage, it's like another gospel, the book of Isaiah, this great passage, Isaiah 53. Hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, it proclaims, he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like this little green, like right now it's spring is coming. You have these little green shoots, like a little tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing is appearance that we should desire him. Jesus was not Elvis Presley. He was not, it was not, there was nothing about it that people would flock to him as so, so handsome or charismatic. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of sorrow, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. Like they're so sick or uh, we didn't even want to look at him. And when he was beaten and ravaged, people could hardly look at him. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. And it, the chapter goes on to say, and this is, the, this is the Messiah, the one who came to die for our sins. By his stripes we were healed. These shepherds probably were taking care of the sheep that were used in the temple sacrifices. The Jewish Talmud in the Mishnah tells us, that the shepherds near the tower of Migdal Elder, outside of Bethlehem, took care of the large flocks used for the temple sheep, and so they were considered clean. These shepherds were considered clean, unlike other shepherds. So listen, we have Bethlehem, the city where King David was from. Well, now what do we know about King David? What was he when he was a little boy, when he was a young man? He was a shepherd himself, right? And remember, he was a shepherd before he was a king, and to this city comes Mary and Joseph. Jesus is... The Messiah has to come from the line of David. That's why he had to move him down from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. <clears throat> and Jesus, who is the king of kings in the line of David, is also the great shepherd. He's called the great shepherd. He's born here, and his birth is announced to shepherds. Shepherds who themselves social outcasts, and to them it was announced that once that society would, one, or that society would reject and despise, uh, and to them it was announced that the one whom we know from the Old Testament would be uh, despised and rejected, had been born. In John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. He's talking about spiritual hunger. We've all got this place in our hearts like there's got to be something spiritual. There's got to be something real. There's more than just life and death. Isn't there such a thing as truth and justice and fairness and right and wrong? This is not just things we made up, right? This is right. This is wrong. This, 
There's, there's, there's a bigness, there's a grandeur to life. Jesus says, come to me and you'll be filled. So Jesus said, I am the bread of life. So we have Jesus calling himself the bread of life, born in a town called the house of bread. We have the great shepherd's birth announced to shepherds in the place of King David, who was also a shepherd, and the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world is born among the sheep who were used as the sacrifices in the Jewish temple. In, as a neat little aside, the, the temple was going to be destroyed in 70 AD. The Jews didn't need it anymore because Jesus Christ had come and there would be no more lambs sacrificed in the Jewish temple. As the angels proclaimed, this is all about the glory of God. Is all about his glory. And we're here today. And if we've got our heads on straight, not because I've got a lot of problems and I need to get right and, and, it's, and it's all about me and my fears and my concerns and my worries. No, we're here and it's all about the glory of God. The birth of Christ is not about glory to me. Heaven forbid. What a sad, pathetic thing to bring glory to ourselves who can hardly tie our shoes right. And I'm speaking metaphorically for most of us. Uh, so much stumble our way through life. Wish we were better Christians. Wish we loved more. Wish we didn't struggle with bitterness and, and, and unforgiveness and, and lust and anger and impatience. All these things, all these things, heaven forbid we'd glory to me. <laughs> That's, a, that's sick. Glory to God. Glory to God, not being full of myself, full of, what are you full of? I am full of bitterness. I am full of personal ambition. I am full of greed, full of lust, full of anger, full of self-serving pride, so I get so ticked off if somebody rubs me the wrong way. Full of fear. I'm so afraid of my health and what the future brings and the finances and relationships. So full of worry for the church, for the kids, for who knows what. Fill in the blank for your own life, right? Glory to God. Praising Him. Not people who use words to make them sound religious. They can put up a wall of sound to make them use all the right Christianese. Glory to, to him, praising him. The angels said, glory to God. They're praising him, not using our words. What do we use our language for, guys? What do, we, what do we talk about a lot? How about griping? How about complaining? How about how fed up we are? How about how much we dislike somebody else? Jesus Christ knew them. He died for them on the cross, and we use our language to rip them down and to discount them, dehumanize them, write them off. Who do we think we are? Who do we think we are? We, we cuss, we belittle people, we tear them down. We ought to be using this tool to praise God and to draw more people into this family. And we moan and we complain and we BS. How sad. It's all about glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. That's what it's all about. That's why this baby was born. Glory to God and to bring peace to everyone on whom God's favor will rest. Come to faith in Jesus. Put your faith in God. Listen, he loves you. He wants to forgive you completely, and he wants to bring you into this family where we can learn, start learning to live lives his way, starting to learn to love people the way he loves people, start learning to care the way he cares, starts learning about truth and, and being a truth speaker, even though it's unpopular, even though it's going to get you a lot of flack, you're going to speak the truth. Glory to God, because it's not all about you and me, is it? It's all about him. And to the degree that my mouth, my heart, my mind are not filled with glory to God, I'm missing the plot of the universe. God sees the mess we're in. He came down in the muck and mire because he loves us. He's calling us to him. If you're a Christian already, but you need to do some repenting, go ahead and do that. What's holding you back? Not him. That's not the Holy Spirit telling you to run away from God. His arms are wide open. If you're not sure you're a believer yet, and you want to be, get it done. You want to believe believer? 
The Bible says, not one who calls upon the name of the Lord will be turned away. Not one. Confess your sins. Admit he's right. We ain't always right. Accept his love. Accept his hug. Accept all that grace. Understand that his ways are lots better than our ways. I'm, I'm not that impressed with Dan Wolf's ways. I know Dan Wolf too well. I know him personally. I am impressed with God's ways. And I don't want to miss the plot. It's all about him. It's all about goodness. All about his truth, his way. So brothers and sisters, uh, you know what? I'm going to read more. I, I was just going to end my sermon there, but I'm not going to know. This is like a bonus time in the playoffs. It's a tie game. You get to go into overtime. That's fun. All right. Uh, from, uh, 19, from 15. When the angels had left them, and it, when they left the shepherds and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem, <laughs> good idea, and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Imagine being those shepherds, and God has singled you out for this message. So they hurried off, you bet they did, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread word concerning what they had been told about this child. Brothers and sisters, have you seen God? Do you know God is real? Have you encountered the living God? Then what would stop us from going out and spreading this word and telling everybody that we know concerning this God? And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. That's your testimony. Share it. But Mary treasured up all these. This is a beautiful picture of a mother, isn't it? She treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Out of the blue, these shepherds come running up. We just met an angel. And he told us that this child was going to be born and told us all this. And this mom, she kept, she went over those things a few times in her mind. She treasured them in her heart. She pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned because they had to get back to work. But they went back different than they left. They're not just sitting out in the cold another day, another same old, same old. They're back at their work, but everything's different now because they encountered Jesus Christ. They went back praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Brothers and sisters, Jesus changes everything. The birth of Jesus Christ changed the world. Has the birth of Jesus Christ changed your life? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we love you. Uh, help us to act like it. Help us to be the kinds of blessings to one another that you intend us to be. You came, Lord, to bring peace between yourself and a fallen humanity. Lord, you call us to be peacemakers. Help us to be very serious about glorifying you in our lives. Help us not to be, uh, give ourselves a pass on bad attitudes. Help us not to give ourselves a pass at willfulness and self-righteousness. And, and uh, Lord, I pray that we bend our knees, humble ourselves to you, and then we, we get up for the purpose of getting out there and telling everybody we know about all the wonderful things we've seen about this great God uh, you've shown yourself to be. Lord, help us to love one another in this church and help us to grow this church. We pray this all in your holy name. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.